Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program, which is one of a four-part guideline series on type 2 diabetes. Today, it's on blood glucose control and patient education. Diabetes, as you well know, is a growing global epidemic with hundreds of millions of people affected worldwide. Every 10 seconds, a person dies from diabetes-related causes and two people develop the condition. In Australia, diabetes is the fastest growing chronic disease and ranks as the sixth most common cause of premature death. It's associated with significant morbidity, including vascular complications, blindness and renal failure. And good control of blood glucose has been shown to reduce complications. And in this program, we are going to specifically discuss two new NHMRC clinical guidelines focusing on patient education and blood glucose management and control in type 2 diabetes. Now, we're going out both as a satellite broadcast over the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network, and we're going out to you as a live webcast. Anyway, here's our question of you watching on computer. Tell us where you're located. Are you located in metropolitan? regional, rural or remote Australia. So we'll come back to the comment your answers later. As usual, there are a number of useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Now let's meet our panel. Stephen Colliguri is Professor of Metabolic Health at the Borden Institute of Obesity, Nutrition and Exercise at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Mark Harris is a general practitioner, director of the Centre for Primary Healthcare and professor of general practice at the University of New South Wales. Welcome, Mark. Hello, Norman. And Lee Spokes is a credentialed diabetes educator in Wagga in New South Wales. Welcome, Lee. Hi. So what are the trends here, Mark? Well, the trends are, of course, that diabetes is increasing in Australia uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Partly that's because of the ageing of the population. We know that diabetes is uh, increasingly prevalent as you get old. Uh, the, uh, the risk of diabetes increases with age and as our population ages uh, that also means that our uh, risk of diabetes increases. Uh, so that's part of the reason but also of course there's changes to our lifestyle. Uh, less, less physical activity, more overweight and all of those things are contributing to what's been called the diabetes epidemic. And what's it like in Indigenous communities? Well Indigenous communities suffer a much higher uh, risk of diabetes. There's about five times uh, the risk for each age group. In fact it, it probably, uh, and it begins earlier, so we're seeing diabetes emerging in young life, in, in people, even teenagers, and in the 20s and 30s, uh, we're seeing type 2 diabetes emerge, and, and uh, rates, as I said, up to five or six times the uh, average in Australian population overall. And in rural communities, Lee, do you see more type 2 diabetes in non-Indigenous communities, or is it just about the same as cities? Uh, I, probably about the same as the cities for uh, the rural areas, in Indigenous populations more. I, I think with the combined, when you look at the data from the, the rural centres, they're obviously looking at a smaller population spread over a larger distance. But in Indigenous communities, definitely more. What did the OzDiab study show for rural communities? Um, the OzDiab study uh, actually was representative of uh, the whole of Australia and tried to uh, sample rural and remote areas, but of course the numbers were smaller. But the, the trend, uh, as you mentioned, was that uh, rates are certainly higher, not only from the OSDIA, but from other studies with higher rates of diabetes in rural and even higher in remote. And that's taking aside the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander influence. So what are the key recommendations from the guidelines on blood glucose control? Because that's the first thing we're going to look at. Yeah, well, the key recommendation and the primary recommendation for um, the blood glucose control guideline was to reiterate the fact that... Uh, that the uh, glycated haemoglobin should be used uh, to assess diabetes control and that the target is uh, one of uh, less than or equal to uh, seven. And uh, the thing that's uh, been more specific about this guideline is to uh, advocate adjustment to treatment if this level is exceeded. And there were practice points. Is that, is that things that just don't have quite the evidence attached to them but are good ideas to do or what? Yeah. So um, the way these guidelines are put together, it gives us an opportunity to make recommendations uh, as practice points if uh, there's evidence that's lacking for some of the things that uh, we would like to, to recommend. And in particular, with respect to uh, practice points, it recommends um, that this should be measured at least uh, twice a year in people with type 2 diabetes who have stable control, but more often if it's not uh, stable. And there are also practice points related to um, uh, GPs and health professionals being aware of uh, the, um, 
the things that can influence uh, glycated haemoglobin. And there are a number of things uh, such as anemia, especially anemias related uh, with shortened lifespan like hemolytic anemias and uh, blood transfusions which can lower the HbA1c and so give you an impression that things are falsely better than they are. Uh, uremia in some situations uh, with some um, measures can actually uh, increase the um, the glycated haemoglobin and then of course people who suffer from uh, thalassemias for example uh, which uh, are quite common in some of the populations that we deal with can also give you false results so HbA1c in general is a, is a good measure but uh, there, there needs to be some awareness of uh, situations where this may give you slightly misleading results. And on what about natural variability in the HbA1c? I mean I realise that's what it's supposed to be this is raison d'etre, is to get rid of natural variability so you understand what blood glucose control is. But with all the debate going on about monitoring tests and perhaps over-monitoring, mm -hmm. is there a risk of just natural variability in the HbA1c? No, there's some small vari variability, as there is with any um, measure, any blood measure. It will vary a little bit from day to day. But glycated haemoglobin is quite stable. It gives you a very good reflection of what's happened over the previous two to three months. And uh, it will not account for, uh, for major differences uh, from one measurement uh, to the next, which aren't explained by something going wrong or improving with the diabetes control. And are you allowed to have a HbA1c over 7? I mean, what's the, what are the, what's the permission there? I oh, know. Well, Doctor. I mean, we, well, we have to be reasonable in terms of uh, this is a, a general... Um, a general target which suits most people but at the end of the day it does not need to be individualized and uh, in some people it's inappropriate to have a target uh, below seven it might be dangerous because of hypoglycemia a really elderly person with a limited life expectancy um, they can have levels that are that are slightly higher so it needs to be modified according to the clinical circumstances let's get the results of uh, this the first poll question tell us where you were located in metropolitan regional rural or remote Australia Let's find out where you are. So rural is uh, the majority, but or is it the majority? No, we've got uh, regional and rural, and uh, metropolitan uh, next. So uh, just the proportions that uh, we imagine there to be. So that's good, and welcome as always to our metropolitan viewers who um, understand where quality education comes. Um, let me ask you the next question. How would you rate your understanding of the link between good blood glucose control, uh, complications and outcomes? Do you believe you have very little understanding? Remember, this is anonymous. We're not going to be able to check it back to see uh, how much you're admitting here. Moderate understanding or comprehensive understanding of the uh, link between blood glucose control, complications and outcomes? I'll get you to vote on that and then see what your results are. Because, Professor Kolaguri, I mean, there is debate about this, that um, just the contribution of blood glucose control, two trials in the last 12 months suggesting that aggressive management of blood sugar really driving the HbA1c below, I think, 6.5 was the figure, showed no benefit and maybe even some risks. I don't think there's any doubt that uh, blood glucose control improves the microvascular complications. The issue has been, and which has been addressed by some recent trials, is the effect of uh, blood glucose control with regard to macrovascular disease. And uh, last year was a little unusual because we had the results of four major studies. And as you mentioned, one of the studies, the ACCORD studies, suggested that driving and pushing uh, blood glucose control too low uh, might result in an increased uh, risk of cardiovascular death. This was, of course, balanced by uh, an improvement or, or less occurrence of myocardial infarction. But um, the advanced study, which was mostly done out of Australia, did not show uh, that, and neither did the Veteran Affairs study. So that, that increased risk does seem to be a spurious result. But none of the studies showed a uh, absolute uh, benefit in terms of the cardiovascular risk. I think that there's an issue here that cardiovascular risk reduction in people with diabetes has been shown to be driven by multifactorial intervention and to try and single out blood glucose control may be a little difficult and may be beyond these studies. So I don't think that there's any overwhelming evidence that it causes harm and I think as part of a multifactorial package um, it does actually uh, improve even macrovascular outcomes. What about the risk of hypoglycemia? Because as some people are suggesting that in fact the link between diabetes and dementia may be hypoglycemia. 
Well, again, hypoglycemia varied considerably between the studies, and I think it reflected the aggressive uh, treatments that, that, that again varied across the study. So the advanced study, for example, was able to uh, achieve its outcomes and achieve uh, an HbA1c of 6.5% without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia, and in fact without weight gain. Some of the other studies had much higher rates of, of hypoglycemia, but I think that that's, uh, that was related to the treatment regimen. Sure, we do not want people having hy unnecessary hypoglycemia, and so as we mentioned, if uh, somebody is getting a lot of hypoglycemia, glycemia, then it would be a cause to cut back on the treatment. And the weight gain is from insulin therapy? No, the weight gain is, uh, is more evident in insulin therapy, but it uh, is also can occur with various medications. Um, sulfonylureas, uh, although the advanced study, which was based on sulfonylureas, did not show that. And, um, and there are some newer medications which are weight neutral or, may, or might even uh, result in weight loss. So it's not a universal thing and I think it depends on how the treatment package is provided. We'll come to the treatment package in a moment. Marissa Pillar has sent in a, a <coughs> web-based uh, question. I've read on PubMed that the latest research shows that older populations with HbA1c lower than 7% had more adverse outcomes, which is really what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's debatable. Yes, it, it is debatable. Um, and interestingly, in fact, the people with the worst outcomes in both the Accord and the advanced study were those that had the highest HbA1c, and it may well have been related to non-compliance with treatment, that they treated themselves aggressively uh, for a period of time and then did not treat themselves uh, very well. And uh, in fact, um, that, that, that statement is, is partly um, correct, but uh, is not reflected in, in the studies. So let's get the results to your question. How would you relate your understanding of the link between good blood glucose control complications and patient understandings? Um, well, nobody's admitted to no understanding. And uh, moderate understanding uh, gets the Guernsey comprehensive understanding of good proportion. So that's um, what's your understanding of the understanding? We'll, we'll work that one out. Now let's go to our next question which is how long do you trial lifestyle modification before commencing a patient on medication medication six weeks three months depends on the patient don't do it at all now is the time to take us through the treatment algorithm Stephen sure so the um, the guideline uh, shows uh, the algorithm that uh, we're recommending for use in, in Australia and <clears throat> This is based on evidence, but also takes into account our uh, PBS rules in terms of what we're allowed, permitted to use through the PBS. And after all, that is uh, how the majority of these medications uh, are actually used. So we do advocate starting off with uh, lifestyle modification, uh, diet modification, weight control, uh, physical activity for a period of time. And we'll see what the responses are before we uh, discuss that a bit further. And if that then fails, then uh, metformin is usually the, the next uh, medication that should be used, provided there are no contraindications to its use. And uh, I think we'll discuss that later, but uh, the main one relates to, to renal impairment. And then if metformin fails, uh, then sulfonylurea still remains the most commonly used uh, second-line therapy. However, if there um, are some contraindications or side effects to the use of uh, either of those agents, then there are a list of other agents that can be used, including acabose, the newer DPP-4 inhibitors such as citagliptin, uh, the glitazones, pioglitazone, rosy glitazone, or uh, insulin therapy. You're still using glitazones, despite the controversy. Uh, the, uh, the most recent evidence with regard to glitazones shows that uh, there, is, there should be no controversy. Right. <laughs> because uh, any of the controversy with regard to increased risk of cardiovascular disease has not been confirmed in the recent studies. Even as um, Marissa Pillar uh, from North Queensland is asking about heart failure. Oh no, sorry, so, so we're talking about cardiovascular risk. Now clearly um, heart failure, uh, there is an increased risk of edema and heart failure and it should not be used in people who uh, have, uh, have uh, heart, a history of heart failure or uh, cardiovascular disease predisposing to heart failure. But that's no different to uh, metformin not being used in uh, renal impairment. So, Lee, how successful is lifestyle modification? You've got to really look at it from a holistic point of view. You've got to look at the whole in the environment that the person is, is in, their family. Uh, if you've got someone that's very motivated, 
and I like to think of the word empowerment rather than um, being adherent or compliant, that if they're empowered and they're motivated, you can have terrific success and you know, lots of people can proceed without needing to um, go on to any oral medications or insulin therapy. But it's a whole gamut of different factors involved there. Their previous experiences, their psychosocial situation, their family history. It, it's a lot of things to take into consideration. You've got to have client-centred focus on their education, working as part of a multidisciplinary team. It takes in a lot of factors. So it's a, it's a simple question to ask the way you ask it, how successful is it, but it takes in so many different factors. Well, before we get to the, the key question related to the guidelines, let's see how people answered the question, which is how long do you trial lifestyle modification before commencing a patient on medication? Six weeks, three months, depends on the patient, don't do it. Uh, well, nobody's not doing it, or nobody's admitting to not doing it. Uh, from the quarter of you say three months, two thirds of you say depends on the patient, and uh, about 7% uh, of you say uh, six weeks. What's the right answer? Well, there is, as far as the guidelines are concerned, there's a right answer, but it's interesting that we get that response, considering what I said, because it takes in all those factors. So you agree with the majority, but that's not what oh, the guidelines say, It's interesting. I'm it? talking from practical. I, I really look at things from a practical perspective, and I think we can look at the guidelines and say, OK, here are the guidelines. They're all in black and white for you. We'd like you to follow these guidelines, but I think what you've got to do is put it down to the patient and, it, and their environment and the education process, the isolation with health workers, the inability to have um, doctors present. We've got health workers that are out there that are, just have them and they're, they're, they're teleconferencing with medical professionals in this area. So it's multifactorial. I don't, I don't think that the answer is inconsistent with the guidelines. <laughs> the guidelines, uh, I mean, they are guidelines. Yep. Um, and uh, we would recommend that under uh, all things being equal, that a trial of, of three months. But there are clearly going to be situations where three months is, is inappropriate. Sometimes it will be shorter if the patient is really symptomatic and you want to bring down those blood glucose readings. And there are other times that they've got a sufficient improvement after three months that you might want to leave it a little bit longer. So th those, those answers are not inconsistent with the guideline. Now, we mentioned the care system for people, Mark, and this is an interest of yours. Is there a right answer to the system of care that needs to be provided? Because the GP can't do it all, the diabetes educator can't do it all. It is classically, you know, what they say, multidisciplinary team care, but easy to say, just like um, yeah, a moment ago, it, hard to do. Yeah, I think there's good evidence that um, for people with diabetes, multidisciplinary care improves outcomes. So I think that there, there's not much doubt about that. It depends on the patients, obviously, and it depends on uh, how complex their uh, problems are and how uh, much support they're going to need. But really, the days of, um, of a GP providing all of the care for all of their patients with diabetes are really uh, over. It's, it's just not feasible. Um, the, we really understand the importance of not only lifestyle modification, but really educating people about their disease and, and their management, because it's about uh, uh, even when people are on uh, therapy, it's about their adherence to medications and so on. Uh, Jane Lemon from South Australia writes, uh, some GPs will not do GP management plans. This makes it difficult for some people with diabetes to, uh, to access a credential diabetes educator. What do you suggest that the patient or diabetes educator should do in these circumstances? That's a good question, extremely relevant, and I work in the rural area, and I know that this, uh, I come across this all the time. And uh, I, I think that what you've got to do is look at, well, how many GPs there? And uh, for the patient, to, they can change GPs. Are they in a situation where they can go to another GP? They can certainly uh, access services that fit into the care model that will leave them accessible to uh, GP management plans and team care arrangements. Is there community health services? Do they have a diabetes educator in that environment? That seems to be uh, available but with long, long waiting lists. So if you've got GPs there, or discuss it with the general practitioner. Go in and, and say to the general practitioner, have you tried that avenue first. Go into the GP and say, I'd like to get a team care arrangement. I'd like to have a GP management. Can I have a care plan? See where the GP comes from. See what his knowledge base is. Talk to the practice nurse. The practice nurses are so important in the, in the whole scope of things. Mark? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the it's things. It's not so easy to get to see a GP in a country town. Yeah, uh, but also one of the things that annoys GPs are reverse referrals. So uh, I think we need to be careful about that. I, I, I think your last suggestion about the diabetes educator actually talking to the GP is probably the most uh, important thing. One of the things we've found in some of the research we've done is that that, that one to one contact is is the key, getting that communication going between the various members of the team. Uh, Sharon Doolan uh, of New South Wales uh, asks, she saw a patient today, dry retching, glucose of 22.4 using home monitor, on home monitor, not eating regularly due to her nausea, consuming large quantities of soft drink and cordial. Is this gastroparesis um, or a peripheral neur neuropathy? There's, sorry, she, she doesn't describe symptoms of a peripheral neuropathy. She's not got deterioration in her vision and her EGFR is 45 mils. And, um, sorry, symptoms, there's a little bit more there to read on that one. Uh, so, what do you think here, Stephen? Um, it, it depends on, on the history. If it's, uh, if it's an acute episode, then it's unlikely to be gastroparesis. Um, but if it uh, persists or has been a problem over a period of time, then it needs to be, uh, needs to be considered. So I can't make a pronouncement on just uh, the, the, that information without knowing uh, the, the time course, really. So if it were gastroparesis, what would be the classical symptoms? Um, you should well, just explain what gastroparesis is, just in okay, case. Okay, so gastroparesis is, uh, and the neuropathy that uh, can uh, result from diabetes uh, ca can affect uh, the bowel, and it can manifest in, in a number of ways, uh, and gastroparesis is really slowing the emptying of, of the stomach, so it causes a feeling of fullness, it can cause, uh, it can cause uh, vomiting. Um, so if it does uh, prove to be gastroparesis, it depends uh, on the diabetes control, and in this case diabetes control uh, seemed to be fairly poor based on that blood glucose reading. Um, improving blood glucose control can uh, improve the gastroparesis or otherwise you need to use some agents that will, um, that will actually um, uh, speed the uh, emptying of the stomach. Um, can I just ask Stephen, isn't it more common in type 1 diabetes? Yep, it is far more common in type 1 diabetes. Presumably because you've had the the diabetes longer. That, you said it was a person with type 2, did you? It was, she, yes, and okay, she's so it does along it, with it does a very make it high more unlikely. blood sugar. Um, are there any specific measures put in place by the guidelines or Department of Health and Aging to address diabetes and its complications in Indigenous communities? Mark, you have some expertise here. Um, yeah, well, I think the guidelines, uh, we, we certainly had input in the development of the guidelines uh, from various uh, uh, members of the Indigenous community and uh, from various Indigenous groups. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, they're designed to be uh, used with all Australians, not just with uh, uh, people who are non-Indigenous. Uh, clearly the issues, are, are one, one of the problems I think uh, that's often found uh, with Indigenous people is that at diagnosis there's often uh, early signs of complications such as uh, renal disease and so that makes managing it a lot more complicated. Um, a question from Rosalie Schultz, Central Australian Remote Health Services asks, and I'm not sure she's right here, but she says European guidelines recommend starting metformin at diagnosis. Why not here? But we do recommend metformin yeah, the, here. There is, there, is, there is a guideline that's uh, been produced by the uh, American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. Um, it, is, it is a consensus guideline and it actually uh, does recommend that uh, metformin be started at the time of diagnosis. Not waiting for lifestyle measures. Not waiting for lifestyle. Okay. And uh, the rationale for that is that lifestyle um, does not uh, work in the majority of people. I, I personally think that that is uh, not a very uh, good excuse for skipping uh, the, the lifestyle. And in fact, uh, that guideline has caused uh, a lot of controversy around the world and uh, is the International Diabetes Federation is producing a guideline which uh, I think we'll not agree with that one. Uh, another question from Queensland asking whether, in your experience, home medication reviews make a difference to adherence and understanding of diabetes care? They can do, yes. I think they're most beneficial because what it will do is a lot of people don't understand why they're taking certain medications, what times to take medications. I think where it comes from a perspective of being able to assess 
what's happening at home. I think it's good because the home medication review that um, they can go out there, sit with the person, see them in their own environment, ask them when they're taking their medications, ask them how they're taking their medications, sit there and l actually spend time with them in their home. I think they're the most helpful, most helpful. I think we're going to revisit the answers to that last question because apparently something might have changed your mind or more results have come in. So let's have a look here. How long do you trial lifestyle medication? That's not that different. So it's pretty much um, uh, the same, really, a little bit um, bigger proportion, I think, um, w tailoring uh, the individual care. Let's go to our first uh, case study. Uh, this is a 43-year-old man who works uh, full-time as a grader driver. He lives in a, uh, in a remote community. Um, he's married with four children, two grandchildren. Um, he comes to see you, he came to see you a few days ago, Mark. Um, really dragged in by his wife. He's got a family history of diabetes. Um, he's saying he's a bit sleepy, he's passing more urine, you know, he's just a bit more moody than normal, and she reckons he's got the family disease, you know, diabetes. He's pretty fat. Um, and, uh, you know, he, said he had an ACL construction, he used to be a bit of a footballer, and as I say, this, and he smokes probably more than a pack a day. Um, and he you know, drinks a reasonable amount, uh, particularly at the weekends. And he's got knee problems and he takes glucosamine, about one and a half grams a day. So when you saw him, he was heavy. He had um, a waist circumference of uh, several kilometers and uh, he was hypertensive, about blood pressure of 150 on 100. Everything else seemed okay. So what would you have done for him then? Then I'll tell you what you actually did do. Well, I think certainly, um I'd want to check his glucose right there on the spot, uh, his, uh, his random glucose, and I'd want to order, ideally we'd want to order some fasting glucose and lipids, but with a patient like this, one of my concerns is that, uh, you know, you, we, we want to give him as little opportunity to opt out as possible. So uh, it, certainly if there's any risk of him not actually having the fasting glucose the following day, um, I'd be... Uh, doing a, uh, a random glucose. Uh, so it's 15? It's the glucometer is on 15. The glucometer 15. Okay, so it's very likely that he's going to be diagnosed with, di with um, diabetes on the basis of his uh, random glucose. Little, we're not probably going to have to go to a fasting glucose. Uh, but I want to check his lipids, his uh, renal function, particularly his creatinine and EGFR and his uh, liver function test because if I am going to th be thinking about starting him on metformin at some stage, uh, whether it's three months from now or sooner, um, I want to know that uh, his kidney function, his liver function was okay, particularly because he's a heavy drinker. So we just saw his results when he comes back for this visit. His wi wife uh -huh. has made sure he's dragged back and so he's got hyperlipidemia, his yep. LDL is high, his HDL is low and uh, his EGFR is normal, yeah. but he's, you, we've confirmed uh, his random blood, sh his bl blood sugar is about 11. And I want to check his blood pressure again because, of course, I need to do that on more than one reading. And, and from all of that, it seems that he's got pretty high absolute cardiovascular risk. Uh, so uh, we're going to need to manage, his, uh, manage that, manage his blood pressure. So his absolute risk, what, would be up 20%, something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, it'll be in excess of 20%. And probably. if he was indigenous? And if he was indigenous, uh, it would probably put him even higher than that, perhaps another 5% more. And so he's at very high risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. And the things that I can do most rapidly to, to address that are to control his blood pressure and to perhaps try and get him to con uh, stop smoking. They're probably my most urgent priorities, as well as, of course, to start to uh, educate him about his... Uh, diet and physical activity, try to get him to lose some weight and uh, start educating him about his, his uh, diabetes. And that's something which perhaps even last visit I would have started with the practice nurse and diabetes educator if they're available because it really, that li he needs to make that lifestyle change even if, even if his diabetes wasn't confirmed on the blood test. Just on the blood test before I come to what the diabetes educator might have done even on that first occasion, do you do an HPA1C on that first visit? Yeah, I think it's uh, useful to do that. Um, you do need to know what the baseline is and it helps to uh, then uh, monitor progress. Uh, so I, I definitely would do an HbA1c at, at the time of diagnosis. Um, I'm actually going to jump question now because it's probably quite relevant for 
um, the discussion we're having and ask you when do you implement, implement uh, patient education? Do you implement it at the initial visit, uh, ongoing, or you don't do it at all? And we'll come back to the answers to those questions. So let's say you're not absolutely sure yet he's got diabetes, but it looks pretty much like it. Would you? I'd, I'd be pretty convinced, Norman. So what would you do with him on that first occasion? He doesn't want to be there. Mm, and and I, this is a case that I would see this sort of um, scenario happening often. Even yesterday I saw someone very similar, very, very similar. And usually where the family members, particularly the partners, has brought them in and they're mm. angry, they're not happy about being there, they can be quite aggressive and they can be aggressive because their blood glucose levels are high. So that they're in that frame of mind just from simply having those sort of high blood sugar levels. And I think the thing, it's a very important asset for any health worker is to be able to sit down and listen and to ask appropriate questions that are open-ended questions. And if you've got the family members there, you have the partners there, and ask them questions and see what they feed back to you and find out what their personal experience is with diabetes. What, do they know what diabetes is? Maybe, for example, if they're an Indigenous person, their uh, experiences with diabetes could be quite terrible and quite dramatic. Well, they can be from even non-Indigenous. So the feelings of um, denial straight away could come and up, this a, is not right, this is not happening There's a pretty big me. portfolio of things they've got to take on board. Huge, mm -hmm. absolutely huge. And what you've got to be very careful of is not sort of information overload. And yeah. we know from any adult education perspective that people are only going to retain what they're told in the first 10 or 15 minutes. So here you are with this person that has these different various things happening and uh, high blood pressure high blood glucose level diagnosed with type 2 diabetes he works this uh, the background on this particular case history is that he is living he has his children in the house grandchildren in the house you've got psychosocial you've got financial concerns he's in a small town family history really the best thing you can do at that visit is to listen and take in what you can assess at that time would be the most appropriate information to give him at that point because you can't say well I want you to stop smoking and I want you to exercise and I like you to change your diet get a really a summary get a summary of where you're at and try to find a direction that you go to which is slightly achievable for that point to give mm. them basic information Mark? yeah I think it's very important to um, tailor our approach to the patient and the priorities of the patient this this uh, dance really got a lot of problems and um, you know one of the things we unfortunately see occasionally from specialist services not Stephen but uh, is that you know patients well, this is not going to admit it to your face come, anyway Stephen. no no it's, uh, but it's you, you know patients come back being told they've got to change this and that you know they're smoking and their diet and increase physical activity and lose 30 kilos and so on and it's, of course it's totally unachievable and uh, I think we have to negotiate with the patient where we start and that's something that um, the GP can do but, but also the practice nurse, the diabetes educator, the dietitian, uh, whoever else is involved in the team uh, needs to be and it needs to be a common approach. It's no good if people are and that's one of the things which uh, a care plan is meant to achieve but it's difficult unless people are actually talking to each other. A question from Tracy Higgins at Rangers Community Health. Um, how many, what proportion of GPs do you think refer patients to a dietitian or similar health professional for health coaching or nutrition education? Is there any data on this? Yeah, well, our studies would suggest it's about 20% of people who are in the high risk group get, uh, get referred. And that's for a whole variety of reasons, including availability and cost and so on. It's not uh, because the GPs don't think that education in, in principle is not a, uh, a good idea, it's the practicalities of it and, and sometimes patients are also reluctant to go. And, well on that, Annabelle Thurlow writes, I'm a diabetes educator in private practice in Port Stephens area in, in, uh, in, New, in Newcastle and New South Wales and finding that patients do not understand what EPCs are, their five referrals in a 12 month period are not enough, especially if the patient needs insulin and uh, asking for greater input from government. Mm. Yeah. And, and, I think and I think what needs to happen, I mean the Australian Diabetes Educators Association and I think in conjunction with the Australian Diabetes Society should push uh, government contacts that we actually 
streamline this service so the GPs don't have that mountain of paperwork to do this sort of referral system and we look at it practically where it's a system of referral, referral that's easier, that we have more visits, that's more patient-centred type of referral process. What the government has put in place is actually quite complex. What the patients should see and understand is, is that it's a simpler process and, and I agree totally with, uh, with Annabelle that it's difficult. It's difficult for the, to the patient to grasp it, it's difficult for the GPs to grasp the concept of mm. what they have to do. Let's just get the results of uh, when do you implement patient education. About half of you uh, implemented at the initial visit and nobody admits to not doing it at all, which is excellent news. That's great. Um, glucosamine, there's some suggestion that glucosamine might make, your, uh, might make you a bit insulin resistant. No. No? <laughs> Fine, let's move on. Um, well, I, no, I'd like to discuss it. I'd, I'd like to discuss it. I'd like to think, uh, to see what Mark thinks about that because I've had ongoing discussions with um, some of the dietitians um, over a period of time and I actually, I actually feel it makes a difference. There were some studies out of the US, uh, I think it's probably a couple of years ago, um, they were actually studies in, in mice. I think that they found that it caused substantial insulin resistance when they increased the doses and I, I think in this particular circumstance He's on far too much glucosamine. There are no human studies which show conclusively yeah. that it does anything to insulin resistance. Yeah, there are no human studies, okay. that's correct. Yes. But I, I think one of the issues <laughs> is also you're just giving a lot of glucosamine to some of these patients with in a situation where we really don't have good evidence that it's effective. So, uh, you know, this uh, man is on... He I should be swallowing what counts. He's on 1.5 grams of glucosamine. That's a huge dose. Um, so, so, at the very least, cutting yeah. it down would be sensible. Let me just backtrack to the diagnosis here. Yes. When is a glucose tolerance test indicated? Glucose tolerance test is indicated if uh, in an asymptomatic person who has equivocal blood glucose readings. So that uh, you suspect somebody might have diabetes and um, <clears throat> you get a result that uh, is say 6.1 to 6.9 is, is usually the range, uh, which is uh, not di fasting glucose, which is not diagnostic. Or you get an equivocal non-fasting one and you need to take it further than that's the time to do an oral glucose tolerance test. Are people still doing too many? No, I don't think that they're doing it enough. Um, 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 it is very difficult, but uh, there are a lot of people with glucose levels in that range of 6.1 to 6.9 fasting who do not have an oral glucose tolerance test. In fact, uh, the study that uh, we were involved with uh, with Mark um, showed that there are only about 30% of people who, were get, who should have had an oral glucose tolerance test actually got one. Now, there are difficulties, and it may be that the diagnosis of diabetes will become easier in the not-too-distant future, but for the moment, a lot of people do need an oral glucose tolerance test. And, and I think one of the messages out of that is that, all right, the majority of people who have a positive, uh, who, who uh, are in that uh, gap between 6.5 and, and 6. Point, uh, sorry, 5.5 and, and 6.9, will uh, have pre-diabetes, but a significant proportion of them will have diabetes. And if we just assume that they're at risk of diabetes and not at risk of, and not having diabetes, we'll actually miss. And of course there are interventions that you take place. I just want to get through a couple of questions. Uh, an excellent question here from Dr. Rajan Pillay from the Caroline Springs Medical Center. Does a decrease in HbA1c necessarily equate to a reduction in overall cardiac risk and mortality? Well, Stephen's probably a better place to answer this, but I think, you know, one of the uh, uh, glucose control is only one of the factors that contribute towards um, cardiovascular risk, uh, stroke and heart risk in people with diabetes. It's multifactorial. It's but none of the absolute risk tools, I'm far my aware, include HbA1c as a factor, do they? The, the UK PDS one does, does it? Mm. yes. Yep. But not, but not the Framingham and the ones that we commonly use in Australia. So yep. does, it, does it, is it a significant variable? It, it is a variable that contributes to reduction uh, in risk. Um, it is true that the recent studies have, uh, have not shown that just reducing HbA1c improves cardiovascular uh, outcomes um, or, or mortality. But as part of a multifactorial intervention, it is a contributor. And a question, uh, should everyone with diabetes be on aspirin or only those that's with a, who've had a cardiovascular yeah, event? That's controversial. <laughs> Yeah. Certainly somebody who's had a, a vascular event, uh, unless it's contraindicated, should be. Mm -hmm. uh, the current guidelines uh, indicate that aspirin uh, should be considered in a person with type 2 diabetes over the age of uh, 55 
again unless it's contraindicated. So let's go back to Dan. What are you going to put him on? Well, it, and uh, the question is when, uh, but uh, particularly whether I'd... So he's got an HbA1c C of 11.5 and his blood sugar's 15 yeah. or something? Um, I'm certainly nervous about waiting three months with lifestyle modification over that period, notwithstanding the guidelines. And that's where we, you know, our comments earlier about uh, being flexible. Uh, obviously, the medication to start with is metformin. I'd probably put him on a long-acting uh, metformin um, to begin with, uh, as, assuming that his liver functions are okay and his, and his uh, creatinine's okay. Which they were. Do you agree with that, Stephen? Yeah, I'd, I'd start off with metformin. Um, no doubt about it. Um, so the only issue is whether you start it straight away or not. Um, and uh, again, I think it's uh, just reiterating what was said before. It's a, a matter of negotiating with the patient about what they're prepared to do. So he comes back in three months. Yeah. His blood pressure's down a little bit. It's you know maybe mm -hmm. 140 on 85. Um, his HbA1c's come down a bit, but not much. It's about 9.8. Mm -hmm. He says he's cut down his smoking, but he's not stopped. Yeah. What are you going to do now, Doctor? Well, we still have to get his, his cardiovascular risk down. We might have reduced it by 5%, but it's still too high. So we, we need to uh, manage that. And I'd be thinking about either increasing his antihypertensives, perhaps uh, starting him on a statin, um, and uh, increasing whatever I'm doing about trying to control his glucose. If, I'm, if I've already got him on a gram of metformin uh, a day, then I'd um, probably initially think about uh, increasing that dose. And if that's not enough, uh, then I'd have to be thinking about adding another uh, agent, another oral hypoglycemic agent. Stephen? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I'd agree. It's, uh, it's, it's a matter of what the person's actually done uh, during the time that it's seen him. There's been a drop of 1.3%, which is not where we want to completely be, but at least it's a reasonable start over a three-month period. Um, to inquire whether there are any barriers to uh, taking the metformin or to implementing some of the other uh, So before you jump into more drugs, is he actually taking the drug you're giving absolutely, him? Absolutely, absolutely. Can I, can I ask the doctors a question in regard to the, what do you consider to be the safe maximum dose of metformin? Which is interesting you ask that because a doctor in New South Wales is right, a GP in New South Wales is saying I've got somebody on 2.2 milligrams of metformin and they have frequent diarrhoea. Yeah, I mean, the mature, I, I rarely would go above uh, two grams, so I guess the 2.2 relates to using an 850 milligram tablet three times a day, or three, three in the day, or four, is it? Anyway, but um, <clears throat> um, I think that uh, the diarrhoea, unless there's some other cause, is almost certainly due to the metformin, and the dosage needs to be reduced in, in this person. Mm -hmm. And so at six months, his HbA1c has come down a bit more, his blood pressure's just about the same. What are you going to do for him now? And Lee's and been we've working got hard on, at him. Uh, Okay, and he's been so he's been making some effort to change mm. his lifestyle, and we're cons and we're, we're fairly sure that he's got uh, reasonable adherence to his medication. At least so his he's wife has. So he's still trucking along at the high eights, let's say, with the yeah. HbA1c. Well, I think we have to certainly, if we haven't already, we need to think about adding a another agent, sulfonylurea. Um, uh, and if we've already done that, uh, then we've got to think. Well, what's the next step? Third line. Yeah, which is. Uh, either third line medications or um, insulin. The, the real problem, I think, again, is as part of this sort of patient-centered approach is that uh, patients in particular are quite reluctant to take that many medications and uh, that's, that makes uh, control really difficult. Um, um, when is insulin indicated? Uh, not yet in this person, I don't think, because <laughs> there's still a, a way to go. I mean, this this person has made a, a pretty uh, significant improvement. He's now down to the high eights, and we're talking about six months after being 11.1, and he's he's making progress. So uh, I think that uh, we ha I don't think there's anything to be gained by using insulin at this particular point. What proportion of people with type two diabetes end up on, should end up or end up on insulin if they're having evidence-based care? Well, approximately 25 percent do do end up on that. Different question. But I don't know the answer to should. Um, uh, it, there are many there are many options uh, of uh, of treatment 
uh, of which insulin is obviously just, just one, and I don't think that there is an answer to that question. Now, we're getting requests from our web audience to have a look at that algorithm again and get you to yes. talk us through it. So let's sure. put it back up on the screen and you walk us through it. Okay. So starting off with lifestyle modification and uh, d despite what some of the other guidelines have said, the majority of guidelines around the world, the UK ones, the Canadian ones, agree with the fact that you should try lifestyle modification first. So we are quite consistent with that. Um, and then uh, met metformin. I presume that there's no issue around that because it's still uh, the, uh, the most commonly used and most commonly indicated because it should be used in overweight people and uh, the latest figures in Australia suggest that 90% of uh, people who with type 2 diabetes attending diabetes centres at least are uh, obese or overweight. So I think that's straightforward. The, the, the next, the next um, line is, is still based on sulfonylureas because of uh, our uh, because they are useful. Obviously, they've been around for a long time, um, but they do. Uh, you need to consider hypoglycemia, and you do need to consider possible uh, weight gain. But they're there because they have been shown to be effective. The the uh, the effectiveness has been confirmed by the advanced study, um, which again is associated with uh, improved uh, microvascular outcomes. Uh, but if either of those two agents, metformin or sulfonylurea, are not tolerated, then you can go to uh, one of those uh, agents on, on the second on the second rung, especially the DPP4 citagliptin, which is a DPP4 inhibitor available here. Or um, has it been on the market long enough to know it's safe? Well, it's been on uh, it's been uh, on the market for uh, in in Australia only uh, several months. Um, Generally, I mean, I don't know how long is it safe. There is a five-year outcome study at the moment, a cardiovascular and other endpoint uh, outcome uh, study that's underway, and uh, we'll know at the end of that. There's no indication to indicate that it's uh, Another not safe. Um, but, uh, you know, how long do you need to do a study on anything to know that it's absolutely safe? So we'll have to wait for the outcome studies. What blood glucose monitoring regime would you have this man on, uh, Mark? Well, that's again, one of the questions we've got. From yeah, and I think uh, the guidelines recommend that they should be that that's an approach which should be individualised, and I think that's very appropriate for this man. Um, I, I think we really need to. Because the evidence at, is not strong. The evidence is not strong, but it, it certainly can be useful as an adjunct to education, and I, I think. Uh, but it does to be useful. It's got to be uh, you know you've got to apply it properly, and they've got to be properly trained and. Um, I think the issue with him is, uh, is he going to adhere to it and is it going to uh, inform uh, him in managing his lifestyle and diet and so on rather than giving in him a, an excuse to eat more. I, my, my criticism of, please don't take offence to these doctors. But we will. But my criticism, We're offended. My criticisms of, um, of uh, the doctor management of self-blood glucose monitoring is that, um, first of all, I think the re regimes often that doctors put people on is too tough and now I want you to test before and after every single meal. And I think that the target that they put for blood glucose levels is, is too high and unrealistic. And this is where I think practice nurses and diabetes educators come into their own where they can put them on a, a workable, understandable, easy to manage regime of testing, get explain to them about blood glucose monitoring. They don't necessarily have to have record books because we now have the technology in place where we can download the information out of the meters and from them we can put them on a variable regime. We can give the person the power, empowering again the person to see, well, this is what will happen when you eat the meals and this is the reaction that will happen with your blood glucose readings, the, what the fasting readings indicate, so that they can actually read what they're doing. I think if we look at data, per se, specific to the blood glucose monitoring, I think it's much more valuable to put it back into a real-life context with the person, which is hard to measure. Stephen? I think the absolute prerequisite for doing self-blood glucose monitoring is whether you as the health professional are going to do anything with the results and whether the patient's going to do anything with the results. And also often it's recommended as, uh, as something that ought to be done. Nobody looks at the results. The patient has no idea what to do with, uh, with the results. Uh, and I think that put in that context, I, th I think it is a useful thing to do. I think it's an adjunct to patient education yes. rather than a standalone uh, activity. Standalone. A different story though, if they're on an insulin. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. If accessing a fasting glucose tolerance test is difficult, is HbA1c a reasonable aid to quick diagnosis? Stephen? 
Um, soon is, isn't it? It's it getting may, close. It, it, it may soon be. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's, uh, it's not... Uh, well, you, you cannot use it for diagnosis of diabetes in Australia or at least claim a Medicare uh, rebate for it. Um, the, the international, uh, there's an international committee that just recently um, uh, suggested that it could be used. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is currently looking at it and it is likely that it will recommend it as an alternative uh, for the diagnosis of diabetes. So the answer at the moment is no, but maybe in a few months maybe the answer yes, will be yes. What does a high fasting glucose level mean when the glucose tolerance test is normal? Um, the, fasting glycemia. No, well, it depends. I mean, Pre-diabetes. Well, it depends. I mean, if, if you've got a, you can have uh, diabetes. So diabetes can either be diagnosed on the basis of the uh, fasting or the two-hour result. And there are some people who have uh, an abnormally high uh, fasting glucose, but the two-hour one is not necessarily high. So uh, if it's above seven on more than one occasion, um, then they've got diabetes, and it doesn't really much matter what the two-hour result is. But the, but many people will have a lower fasting one and have a diagnostic two-hour one. Why is pre-diabetes not covered by the EPC? Shouldn't we be trying to halt the progression from pre-diabetes to type 2 diabetes? Excellent question. Congratulations, you said. Annabelle Thurlow, one of your colleagues, asked Annabelle, it. well done, Annabelle. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with the, uh, with the diabetes health check, uh, is that we can assess people and identify that they've got pre-diabetes, but um, Although we can uh, refer people to group programs, uh, we can't refer them to uh, individual dietitians and so on. That's a real problem. I've got two questions here the on the same system. topic, one from the Northern Territory, one from Queensland. Starting insulin, the evidence that starting insulin early leads to better outcomes. Um, there, there are no outcome studies which have actually uh, shown that. Um, the only study which uh, actually randomised people to insulin at uh, the time of diagnosis was the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study and it showed uh, outcomes that were similar no matter what you started people, people on. So uh, there's, there's, no, there's no evidence that starting insulin will actually result in better outcomes at the time of diagnosis. Because, because in, in essence what we're doing is controlling blood sugar, whatever the, whatever the means of doing it. Absolutely. And oral contraception and metformin and the metformin's effects on fertility? I suppose if you've got uh, PCOS it improves fertility, doesn't it? It increases mm. the risk. Mm. What about interactions with oral contraception? No, no major in interaction. Okay. Let's very briefly go to our next case study because we're running out of time. Um, this is a new patient to your practice, um, Mark, a lady who's 60 years old, runs a fish and chip shop. She comes in for a diabetes check. She's otherwise well. She's type 2 diabetes diagnosed two years ago, she tells you, controlled on her diet. When you examine her, she's overweight. She's got a fair waist circumference and uh, her blood pressure is up. Nothing, else, nothing much else to find. When you do some exam, you, know, you take some bloods on her, HbA1c is up a little bit. Her creatinine is up a bit and her EGFR is down and her total cholesterol is high-ish but certainly with a high LDL and a low HDL. She's on an ACE inhibitor. Yeah, well, she's clearly got a problem with uh, having uh, reduced renal function, and that's a worry. And uh, so I'd be concerned to try and uh, protect her kidneys as much as possible. So I'd be uh, increasing her ACE, trying to control that blood pressure. Uh, her blood pressure is not optimal. Um, we'll control her cholesterol also want, look at, also want to look at her ACR as well. Um, sorry, would controlling a uh, controlling a blood pr uh, cholesterol is useful. Um, uh, I think in terms of reducing her overall absolute risk, uh, the effect on her renal function. And what's the rationale for ACR? Well, the fact that she's got diabetes, and we want to know whether she's got uh, that's. The ACR is perhaps likely to be more sensitive. Alb uh, albuminuria is likely to be more sensitive than just. Uh, uh, EGFR. So if she's got um, an, an EGFR which is falling and she's got increasing albuminuria, then that's certainly a worry. And I'd, I'd be uh, con um, most concerned about her renal function. Uh, uh, her elevated HbA1c is a problem, uh, but it's at this huge. point it's not huge and I certainly would be uh, uh, worried about jumping in and starting metformin. Um, all the uh, at, at, with that kind of renal function. Oh, and the only other point to make about the uh, proteinuria is uh, 
that uh, if it's not present, uh, then you do need to have a look at other causes, consider other causes of renal impairment unrelated to, to the diabetes. And what's a renal physician going to suggest for her, assuming when you're in a country town you can get access to a renal physician? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think one of the things... Sorry, what did you say, Lee? If you can. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, I, I think what a, a renal physician is obviously going to be looking at, uh, again, her, her uh, kidney risk factors and how they can be controlled, including uh, hypertension. But um, I, I, ultimately, we want to be sure that this patient's not going to wind up in full-scale renal failure. What I'd like to do now is show you a case study about integrated patient education. It looks at the model of patient education being used by GP Access in Newcastle and New South Wales and it not only delivers effective education but it helps to upskill practice nurses. I believe that structured diabetes patient education is very effective because there's such a lot for the, the patient to learn and all patients learn at different rates. You know, they have different capacities for taking in information. So when you have a structured plan, you can go through step by step with them, ensuring that they get all the information they need to self-manage their diabetes. I noticed that you've had diabetes for about three years. Correct. And you've been managing quite well until recently, is that right? Yes. And you've noticed that a few of your levels are now a little bit higher than what they uh, they should be. Yes. Well, diabetes is one of the only chronic diseases that is self-managed. So on a daily basis, people are making a decision about what they eat, how much they eat, when they're going to exercise, what medication they're going to take, and when they're going to monitor their blood glucose levels. And that's because type 2 diabetes is a progressive disorder, so things are changing all the time. Now, I'd like to have a look at your monitor, if I could. Okay. All right, so you've been having a few high fasting levels, I can see. Yes. Uh, what medication are you currently taking at the moment? I'm on Amaral, 3 milligrams. When I see a patient the first time, I would see them for uh, 50 to 60 minutes uh, and then they would normally come back for a review which is about 30 minutes and then if they're suitable for groups, I would encourage them to attend group education which is normally a group of uh, three hours. Okay. That's good. As part of that, um, the patient then is seen also by a dietitian. Now, each patient is entitled to five referrals to an allied health professional in a calendar year. My name is Leonie Tolk and I'm a practice nurse at Valentine Family Medical Practice and we're about 20 minutes out of Newcastle. So this morning's session was uh, working with one of my diabetic patients and inviting Annabelle to join us. All right, that, that's, that's really, really good. Right. It's really important that when we're actually looking at diabetes, it is a progressive disorder, and that we actually work in an integrated care team. And what that allows us to do is to actually bring people in with more specialised skills and knowledge to improve the patient's education, improve the outcomes. It's also a fantastic opportunity as a practice nurse to actually listen and actually learn um, from the diabetes educator um, ideas that we can be integrating into our care with our individual patients as well. Let's talk about your portion control. So if you get your dinner plate, you should be aiming at like an, about a nine inch dinner plate, visually divided into quarters. Now, one quarter should be your protein. So that will be your meat, chicken, fish, cheese, eggs. Every single time I work with Annabelle, you know, whether that would be in a formal practice nurse education environment or whether it's actually with a patient, there's always something that you pick up. So it's whether it's how she's positioned something, how she's simplified an explanation, um, how the patient's responded to something that she says. You go, okay, that's something how I can incorporate into when I'm dealing with patients as well. Oh dear. The potatoes, pumpkin? No. no. Parsnips and corn. Right. Because remembering that Diabetes um, is a disorder that affects um, all socioeconomic groups. So it's really important that we try and customise our delivery of education um, to each individual patient um, and how they, how they learn, how they take information on and how we can motivate them. Leonie, I believe that you set some goals with Namus when he last saw you. 
So let's have a look at some of those. How's he gone? In fact, we did. So um, there was three goals. Do you remember when, I was, when we, we spoke three months ago? Um, lose three kilos in the three months, um, have two alcohol-free days, and the third one was to actually increase your walking five days a week, uh, 45 minutes. As a diabetes educator, I find it vitally important that I work closely with the practice nurses. I realise there are some educators who are a little bit scared by the practice nurses thinking that they're going to take over our roles but I think as an educator um, I, I work towards um, bridging that gap and I do a lot of training with practice nurses so to bring them up to speed and I act as a resource person for those practice nurses. Yeah, I am such a great fan of this integrated care model because, of course, we don't have the time to spend with each individual patient that we would love to do. So working in an integrated care model, it means that we can actually share that education, um, share that overall care. It means we can be seeing more patients. It's reminded me that I've probably not been as compliant as what I should have been. Um, and I need to be a bit more vigilant in uh, my diet. Um, and uh, probably reduce, um, reduce my alcohol intake and um, attempt to do a bit more exercise. It is definitely cost effective because the cost of having diabetes is enormous. So if people aren't being educated and are developing the complications of diabetes, that is costing uh, the health uh, system an enormous, enormous amount of money. We know that patient outcomes are improved. It absolutely decreases their risk of developing comorbidities um, and uh, it improves their overall um, quality of life. Um, and it's an amazing to be part of that team where you know you can make a difference. But as an individual, you don't make the difference. It's as the team you make the difference. And it really is that patient being the centre of the team um, that actually makes it work. Thanks to GP Access in Newcastle. One very last, quick last question. What's the minimum age for starting metformin? Any, any contraindications with puberty? Stephen? Oh, it's actually started uh, even uh, in under 10s these days as we're seeing people with type 2, two diabetes and there's no real contraindication. No with problem. With puberty, yeah. Okay. So what are your take-home messages, Lee? Well, there's three, really, to condense it down. And that is to listen. Very important to listen to, to the person that you're looking after. To keep it simple. Don't give them too much information all at once, spread it out. And finally, to work as a team. You've got a team. I know it's hard if you're isolated in a remote area, but try and access a network that you can talk to them on, on the net or phone calls or teleconference, but work as a team. It, it works much better. Mark? It's about controlling the glucose together with all the other risk factors. Uh, we really need to get optimal control and uh, the key, one of the keys to that is patient education using the whole team, uh, but also not being afraid to add other medications. I think that uh, there's incontrovertible evidence that controlling glucose and controlling the other risk factors does improve both microvascular and macrovascular outcomes. Obviously the challenge is achieving that improvement. I don't think it can be done without the team, as has already been emphasised, but also negotiating with the patient and uh, actually getting the patient and uh, negotiating with the patient to see what they're prepared to do and doing it in a stepwise fashion and addressing any barriers to them uh, making the changes that you'd like them to make. Thank you all very much indeed. And I hope you've got a lot from tonight's program, Type 2 Diabetes, Blood Glucose Control and Patient Education, one of four programs that uh, we are doing on Type 2 Diabetes. A copy of the guidelines can be downloaded from Diabetes Australia, and that's diabetesaustralia.com.au. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised in the program, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, and that's at rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and please register for CBD points by completing the attendance sheet. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.